Hello, and thank you for joining the Vegetable Education Conference as part of the 2021 Virtual Southeast Regional Fruit and Vegetable Conference. I am Justin Sheely, County Extension Agent with the University of Georgia, and will be the moderator for this presentation. I'd like to thank Bayer Seminus for sponsoring the 2021 Vegetable Education Conference. Let's watch a short video provided by Bayer and Seminus. Thank you again to Bayer and Simmons. Pesticide CEU and CCA credits are available for most presentations offered during the live Southeast Regional Fruit and Vegetable Conference. Check the Pesticide CE Guide for a list of approved presentations and participating states. The Pesticide CEU Guide is located in the Event Resources tab under the Media Player. The guide is also available at the Resource Center located on the main menu of the conference platform. <clears throat> Please note pesticide credits will only be available, one for registered attendees and only during the live conference. Credits will not be available for on-demand viewing. There is a simple three-step <clears throat> process to receive pesticide CEU and CCA credits. First, go to the audience chat box located on the left side of your screen and type your first name, last name, and the states in which you are requesting credits. Again, go to the audience chat box located on the left side of your screen and type your first name, last name, and the states for which you are requesting credits. You will need to do this for every presentation to request CEU credits. The second step is to sign out at the end of every presentation. To sign out, go to the audience chat box then type your first name, last name, and the states for which you are requesting credits, and you will be, remain, be reminded to sign out at the end of the presentation. The third step is to complete the pesticide CEU registration. You only have to complete this registration one time during the conference. This is not required with every presentation. To access the pesticide CEU registration web link, open the pesticide CEU guide on the event resources tab located under the media player. The pesticide CEU registration link will be located on the front cover of the guide. This presentation is pre-recorded to reduce technical difficulties. We will be answering your questions live at the end of the presentation. You can submit a question at any point during this presentation by typing your question into the questions box and pressing send. Don't forget to thank our 2021 conference sponsors and exhibitors by visiting the virtual trade show and featured products pavilion. Lastly, don't forget to join, to join us each morning for coffee chats and each evening for networking. Check the conference agenda for details. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Stormy Sparks, UGA Extension Entomologist with the University of Georgia who will be presenting our insect update. Thank you, Justin. Uh, as Justin indicated, I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, insect management updates for 2021, talk about uh, pesticide registration changes and some of the uh, research that we've done in, in 2020 with insect management and vegetables. First of all, really don't have any new active ingredients uh, for insect management and vegetables, we do have one new product uh, that's a premix of two products we already use. That's Sinstar from Valent. It is a premix of Spirotetramat, which is the active ingredient in Movento, and Pyroproxifen, which is the active ingredient in NAC. Now, if you put out a full rate of Sinstar, you're putting out a full rate of Movento and a 40% rate of NAC. So it's not a, a, a full rate of both products. Uh, in this premix. 
One thing to be aware of, uh, Movento, which requires a penetrating surfactant. The Sinstar also requires a penetrating surfactant. You don't want to stick this to the leaf. You want to help it get into the leaf, and then one spiral tetramat enters the plant. It's uh, highly systemic. It moves both in the xylem and phloem, and will move throughout the plant. So put a penetrating surfactant with the Sinstar. Uh, it's labeled, we'll, we'll use it primarily for white flies, but it's also very good on aphids uh, and suppression of a variety of other, of other pests as well. <clears throat> it's labeled across a lot of crop groups, basically anywhere where Movento and, and NAC, if both of them are labeled on a crop, then Sinstar will be labeled on that crop. You see it's on brassica and leafy greens carrots, fruiting vegetables, legume vegetables, potatoes, and sweet potatoes. Uh, it has a seven-day pre-harvest interval on most of those crops. On fruiting vegetables, it's one day, and the re-entry interval is 24 hours. Other registration changes to be aware of, one that actually occurred last year, but I didn't point it out, so I pointed out this year, is Avant is moving over to Avant Evo which is the same active ingredient, same concentration. It's a different formulation. Uh, they indicate it should go into solution better. Uh, and they did add dried and succulent beans to the label last year. So, so you can use it on your snap beans and in, in the uh, cow peas. Lors ban, uh, everybody's been ho hopefully been keeping up with Lors ban. Uh, Corteva did announce that they would cease production of chlorpyrifos in 2020. However, there are, other, there are other sources of chlorpyrifos, and those generic uh, chlorpyrifos products will remain on the market. Lorsban will probably very likely be available for another year or two as well, uh, but the generics will remain on the market. EPA is continuing re-registration of Lorsban, so it's still being evaluated. Uh, Corteva is supporting that re-evaluation, uh, but, you know, it remains to see what will happen there. Undoubtedly, chlorpyrifos will continue to be challenging the courts as well. So the long-term availability is unknown, but we should have it for another year or two at the very least. Uh, the final one to be aware of is Black Hawk. It is a spinosad product. It is being discontinued. That specific product was developed for a couple of markets. Uh, the company is looking at how to address uh, those markets with their their current products. Uh, so hopefully we'll see something along the with this uh, Spinetta Rams or something to, to help address those specific markets where Blackhawk plays a role. Uh, research and extension, extension activities. Uh, one of the things we always try to emphasize is that we really can't do this without funding. Uh, the University of Georgia, very, I'm proud that they pr provide my salary and a place to work, uh, but most of the actual work that we conduct is supported uh, by outside funds, and we want to recognize particularly the Georgia Agricultural Commodity Commission for Vegetables and the Vidalia Onion Committee provide a lot of support for the research that we do. Our industry partners, we could not function without. I simply could not do my job without the, the, the work that we do with our industry partners. And then we also get federal grants and federal funding provided through grower support. That grower support is, is tremendous as, as far as supporting what we do. <clears throat> Update on pepper weevil first, 2019-2020. Uh, uh, we're continuing to look at trapping of pepper weevil for monitoring overwintering and and hopefully be able to use it in season as well. But one of the things we learned very early on is these pheromone traps don't work as well when plants are in the field. It's, it's an aggregation pheromone. It's not a sex pheromone, so it's not as strong. And if that aggregation pheromone is combined with some plant extracts, it makes it more attractive. And when you put plants out there, the competition with the plants, the efficacy of that trapping drops off dramatically. So we've been looking, working with Tracy at looking at different combinations of, of, uh, of the pheromone with plant extracts to see if we could increase the efficacy of the trapping and also looking at the sticky cards to see if it, we can make them last longer. First of all, looking at the sticky traps, this is, if you look at this graph, the first 
entries there are one week, then two, three, four, five, and six weeks after they're put out in the field where we're not changing them compared to we're changing them every two weeks. And you can see that those sticky traps are easily lasting at least a month. Now, when we use them in the field, we change them every two weeks just to be certain that we're getting good efficacy. But particularly in the winter, if you're using traps, they're probably lasting at least a month as far as the stickiness for catching weevils. Looking at different plant extracts last year, we looked at a couple of different ones and different combinations, uh, strengths of them. Again, where we did not uh, replace them, we replaced them every two weeks and every four weeks. You can see here, if you go into one, two, three, four, you look at that peaks five and six weeks after we put them out, there's not a lot of differences there. So again, our pheromones, the pheromones that we were playing with last year worked a little bit better. It's not dramatically better than the standard pheromone, which is in the brown line. Uh, but also you can see that those pheromones are lasting probably for at least a month. So where they're recommending that you can use them up to a month, I think that's accurate. Again, in our research, we change them every two weeks just to make sure uh, we've got uh, fresh materials out there. Now, we did do a lot of trapping last year. Our county agents trapped in uh, Grady County, Brooks County, Eccles County, Colquitt County, and Tiff County last year. Uh, two to four fields in each of those counties. You can see that we caught a lot of weevils at the peak. We're getting 200 weevils per trap in a week. Now that's all the trap and, and the, the peak's really not what we're worried about. What we want with weevils is to reach zero. And if you look at this, just the bottom line, you can see that there's very infrequently do we reach zero and we're not staying there most of the time when we get there. And if you look at all the traps and average it, average it by week, <clears throat> you can see that our populations do drop off down during the winter as we go into the spring and start planting but they're really not zeroing out. And that's what we would like to see. So we're obviously overwintering weevils. That's why weevils are becoming a more consistent problem for us. Uh, they're just simply, we, we're, we're starting out the spring with weevils in the field. They're not coming up from Florida. Uh, we're, we're maintaining them throughout the year at this point, which is, which is not good news for us, obviously. As far as efficacy of insecticides against weevils, one of the things you've got to realize is you only kill adults because that's the only stage that's, that's uh, you can expose to the insecticides. This is a bioassay that Dr. Riley conducted uh, in 2020. Uh, one of the things you'll see, the products that we already know are good or, or, or continue to look work, to perform well against weevil adults. That's Vidate, uh, Ectara, Belay, which unfortunately is no longer labeled for us, look good, uh, and a sale. Those are probably our primary products that we're using for weevils. The XRL and Torac, which we're working in generally in rotations, are not giving us the level of mortality that you see with those other products, but they are impacting weevils in other ways. Uh, so I think those are products we can continue to use in our rotations. Dibrom did not give a lot of direct mortality either, but uh, it, it could be a rotation partner as well, although it only, it only gave, you know, about 50% mortality. We do have an experimental product that has looked excellent. Unfortunately, it's probably going to be two or more years before we see that product on the market, if we get it at all. And at that point, it would very likely be limited to pre-bloom application. So we might be able to use it to clean up a field before it starts fruiting, but it won't be an in-season product for us, I don't believe, ever. <laughs> On pepper weevil, one of the things I want to remind everyone of is that, again, you can only control the adults, so it's more of a preventive program. This is not a pest you want to get behind and try to catch up with. Uh, it does require fruiting forms in the field for reproduction, so you don't have to worry about weevils when they're out there, when the crop is not uh, putting on fruit. You don't have buds out there. They'll feed on the foliage. They can survive on the foliage, but they can't reproduce. But then you really need to start your insecticide applications if you have weevil in the field at the very first indication of any kind of fruiting form. And then if you've got weevils in the system, you know they're in the field, you go to a maximum of a five-day spray interval or once a week 
interval with pepper weevil simply will not work for control. It's a maximum of five days, even under low pressure. And then what I always try to emphasize is when you're finished with a crop, destroy that crop. Uh, don't let the weevils reproduce at the end of the season. Uh, the more food they have, the longer they can survive. So crop destruction, particularly in the summer, if we could get a month between a fall, a spring crop and a fall crop with the summer, weevils can't live very long without uh, food available, whereas in the winter they can live a fairly long time even without food. But crop destruction for trying to prevent carryover from crop to crop. Diamondback moth, we continue to work with quite a bit, primarily doing bioassays now. We do some field trials still, but really a field trial just takes a long time to find out what we can find out in a bioassay. We know efficacy varies field by field. We can do bioassays and determine fairly rapidly what has the potential to work. We still do field trials for new products, new approaches for management, uh, where we're not worried as much about resistance, but just simply whether or not uh, a product or an approach will work. One of the things I've done is four bioassays we've run in October and November is, uh, in addition, to make notes on the amount of feeding in the bioassay. If you look at this uh, Petri dish in the middle, that's the check. And four products that have consistently reduced feeding or would provide uh, protection, feeding protection to the crop are Avant, Torac, Radiant, and Proclaim. Now they don't always provide, haven't always provided high mortality, but they have consistently uh, provided a, a reduction of uh, feeding or protection of the crop. As far as actual mortality, the products that have worked most consistently, these are these uh, four that we did in October and November in Barron, Emanuel, Tift, and Colquitt County. Uh, Proclaim and Radiant were probably more our most consistent, but even there you can see sometimes they're down around 50%. So we do have resistance across all these products, but those two are, are working most consistently. Avant and Torac, uh, the mortalities uh, lower than the Proclaim and Radiant, but again, they, they were showing obvious effects on feeding or reduction of feeding. Of concern is the fact that Corrigin, x and Harvanta all look relatively poor in all four bioassays. Corrigin has not worked well for us for two or three years, but x and Harvanta have kind of, you, some fields they look good, some fields they have not. Uh, but in this case, it looks like that resistance to that overall group 28 may be getting higher and that we're getting poor efficacy out of all three of those products at this point. Uh, and then Synstar, we looked at simply because it's a new product and the question came up as to whether or not it would have efficacy. Uh, it, it's probably not, it's not going to look great in this kind of bioassay anyway because of its mode of action. But most of the work we've done with it indicates it may have some activity on Diamondback, but I don't believe it's going to be a Diamondback type product. It might be something where if you're spraying for white flies or aphids, you get some activity on Diamondback, but I don't believe it'll be a product that you would select specifically for Diamondback. Uh, other products we've been working with, particularly last spring, did a lot of work with Spear Lep uh, and the uh, Diatomaceous Earth products. Uh, here you can see the Spear uh, typically, you want to tank mix it with Zentari. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with that, uh, working with the company. We're trying to figure out how best to use the product. Uh, full rates of Spear with a full rate of Zentari has not worked well for us. They're indicating that reduced rate of Zentari so that you don't impact feeding and they get a better dose of Spear uh, will work better. We'll continue working with that. I have not given up on this product but I haven't gotten great efficacy out of it yet. Uh, the same is true of the diatomaceous earth and bioassays. We get very little mortality out of it. Uh, I've looked at it alone. I've looked at it in combination with other products, with insecticides, uh, and, and just simply haven't gotten great efficacy out of it in these bioassays. 
had one field trial where we had good, pretty good populations last spring as well, where we looked at the Zentari spear lip and uh, the sea light, which is uh, one of the diatomaceous earth products. As you can see here, the diatomaceous earth product gave us very little protection of the crop, if any. Uh, and the spear lip really did not look much better, if any better, than, than the BT alone. Uh, so we continue to working with these products, but at this point, I really don't, uh, I can't say that I know how to use them that provide us uh, much additional benefit. Several leaf white flower research, I won't go into a great deal of detail simply because there's another 30 minute presentation on uh, insecticide efficacy and resistance management for silver leaf white fly. Uh, you can see that later in, in the program. Uh, I, I will mention that we do have the one new product for white fly, the Sinstar, which is really, again, not a new product, but a premix of two products we already use. Uh, it, it appears to work well on white flies as well as the individual products. And I don't know of any obvious failures of registered products. So those products you've used over the last two or three years should still work. They don't work like they did when they first came out, when they were first used. Uh, but they're working similarly to the way to the way they have the last few years. There's no field failures that I know of. I will touch on the fact that I that I think uh, it's important that we didn't have a disaster with white flies this fall. Uh, we were setting up for one, to be quite honest. Uh, we had some pretty high population build up in late summer. We actually had some fairly high populations in the spring. But populations were really starting to grow in late summer. Viruses were detected early, and I really expected a disaster in 2020, and that didn't happen. Those explosions of populations in August and September didn't occur. Uh, we got, I think, some help from natural biological control. If you looked on the bottom of leaves and saw the adults stuck on there with the white tufts of growth, that's a seria. It's a fungus that attacks white flies. That helped us a lot. But I think our cotton growers helped us a lot too. Uh, they controlled the problem in cotton much better than they did in 2017. Uh, and that prevented that uh, massive movement to vegetables in the fall. Uh, so I think we really had a, a success as far as an area-wide management program this year. We need to, as vegetable growers, set up for next year to, to have that success as well by managing uh, the white flies in our crops, our winter and spring crops, and then destroying those crops when we're done with them so that we don't produce more white flies. One th study I did do with white flies that I'll uh, show you right here real quick is on sweet potatoes. Uh, we're the only place in the country that has both sweet potatoes and sweet potato white flies, so there's not a lot of information out there on them. This is one where we're just simply looking at, at whether or not for certain that white fly reduce shields. Uh, we grew sweet potatoes with no insecticides, sweet potatoes where we put out a very marked drench shortly after transplanting and followed with uh, Savanto Prime foliar applications every two weeks. Uh, that last column is Savanto Prime where we started at two weeks after transplanting and, and sprayed every two weeks. And then the middle, the third one there is Savanto Prime with just two applications. Uh, and you can see where we put in more insecticide, better white fly control. Well, we got improved yields, which doesn't really, shouldn't surprise anyone, uh, but it is something we needed to verify. And the fact that we can con get control of white flies uh, in sweet potatoes with these products is important to know as well. Uh, so those are probably our best products that, that are labeled in sweet potatoes. Uh, <clears throat> and we can do it with the Verimark drench as part of the program or, or strictly foliar products. And there are other products available as well that should work. Also in sweet potatoes, we continue to look at trying to look at soil insects. They're rather difficult to work with. Uh, one of the things we've been looking at is the bifenthrin uh, drench or chemigation rather than a spray and, and physical incorporation, which we normally do. Sometimes we get delayed and the crop starts vining, starts running, and we can't go in there and physically incorporate. 
Uh, we've looked at it before with the chemigation. We've shown that that works. We're putting it out. We're trying to simulate putting it out with an irrigation system. We're putting about 3,000 gallons per acre. We make three passes with the rig that you see there. With that approach, we can also look at different timings of that side dress rather than having to do it before the crop vines. And we went in and looked at 21 days post transplanting, uh, an application at 21 and 42, and an application at 14, 35, and 56 days post transplanting. Now, we didn't get significant differences. Again, soil insects are horrible to work with. But you can see that as we increased our insecticide use in multiple applications, we did decrease uh, damage somewhat. Hopefully this would look a lot better in a whole field situation. Uh, but after working with this a few years, I, I feel comfortable that the chemigation works as an incorporation technique and that uh, split application is probably going to give you better efficacy than that single application early in crop development. Uh, and one thing that's important I get, should mention is that these are all, again, these are all drench applications, getting it into the soil, establishing that, that insecticide barrier. Foliar applications have not shown this kind of a result uh, in any of the work that I'm aware of. Uh, finish up with some BT sweet corn work. I know nobody really grows a lot of BT sweet corn, but I'll mention it anyway. We continue to look at that. Basically, we're looking at a conventional, that first bar versus a single gene BT, uh, stack cry protein, and then the last five all have the VIP protein in it. Uh, and if you look at world damage, that's primarily fall armyworm. Fall armyworm is still susceptible, and even the single gene BT sweet corn looks good. When you look at corn earworm and ear damage, you can see that the conventional, the single gene and even the stack cry protein products, that's the performance series products, really aren't performing for us anymore because of BT resistance. But that VIP protein looks excellent. Uh, and if you look at the actual caterpillars in there, you're getting caterpillars developing, large caterpillars in there. The, the Conventional is actually low because those caterpillars have already matured, cut out to pupate in the soil. So you're getting a little bit slower growth in the in the single gene, the single cry, and the stack cry protein products, uh, but they're still growing and, and surviving. Whereas in that VIP protein, you get almost you get no caterpillars basically. One thing to remember if you do start growing BT sweet corn, it will take care, particularly those VIPs. Uh, protein products. It will take care of the caterpillars, but you've got to still spray for secondary pest. And this is mostly sap beetles. And then in the fall, you can get, get uh, silk fly as well. Last thing I'll touch on is potential pyrethroid resistance in the corn earworm. Uh, this is a big concern for sweet corn growers because we primarily use pyrethroids for management. Uh, we did have a field collection made of uh, corn earworm in a field where we had poor control with pyrethroids. That was given to Dr. Greg Payne at University of West Georgia. He's been doing this uh, resistance monitoring for a couple of decades now. Uh, preliminary results, the colony's not doing great, but he's showing only about a 1.5-fold resistance to cypermethrin. And really, you don't tend to see, start seeing reductions in efficacies until you're five or tenfold. So that doesn't appear to be an issue right now, but we keep con continue to keep an eye on it. Of interest is the MVP2, which is the cryoprotein, 110-fold. And that's why that single gene BT and even the stack cryoprotein BT sweet corns aren't working for us anymore. Now, the pyrethroid resistance, if it does become worse, is of great concern because uh, previous research we've done with trying to replace the pyrethroids with products that have longer residual activity. They cost more, so you're hoping that longer residual activity will allow you to apply them on a, a longer interval, and that simply has not been the case. In order to get the efficacy that we need, you still have to apply those products even on a very close interval, so it becomes very expensive very quickly. So this is a resistance issue, is something we'll have to keep an eye on, uh, and hopefully it won't become uh, unmanageable in the near future. 
I thank you for your attention.